Well, welcome to our Money Show panel on artificial intelligence. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jim Francis. I am the Chief Investment Officer at ETF Managers Group. In Summit, New Jersey, we manage lots of great thematic ETFs, uh, inclus including uh, a couple of artificial intelligence products, and hopefully you find them very useful. Uh, artificial intelligence can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. I think of, uh, doesn't date me, 2001 A Space Odyssey uh, <laughs> with the HAL 9000 and uh, also maybe the Terminator. Uh, you know, machines that kind of learn for themselves and make, you know, and get better and better and better as they, as they learn more. Uh, our distinguished panelists, I think we're very lucky to have them all here today. Um, from, first of all, from Ocean Capital. We have uh, Mitch Kessler, we have Manuel Fajardo there. Uh, they work very closely with Jim Rogers on the, uh, the, the Jim Rogers AI global macro strategy. Uh, they're here to tell us how they use artificial intelligence to construct uh, their portfolio, which uh, is called Biker. We also have from Equibot, Art Amador, Cheetah Katua, they employ their own version of, of AI in the construction of a fund called AIEQ. Uh, I'll be asking them some questions um, that hopefully get to the heart of their strategies, which I think are very different, but also you know, similar in that they're, they're artificial intelligence related. Uh, and uh, my goal is to get their unique perspectives on uh, this topic, which as you can see from the big crowd here, uh, I think it's very important to people these days and everybody wants to hear about it. So we'll try and get through things pretty quickly so that we can turn over the audience uh, for your questions. And so without further delay, uh, let me direct the first question uh, over to Cheetah. Uh, why don't you tell us how you employ AI in your process and, and how you feel it pays off versus, say, a more traditional investment approach. Uh, thank you, Jim. Just to uh, start with, um, AI is not Terminator. <laughs> um, it's beyond that. So if you think about AI, actually there are a lot of, uh, uh, lot of ways you can apply as AI. And there are some companies that use AI more as a black box, like you throw in some data, it establish the correlations and then you can find out uh, how the correlations you can use it um, like in a quantitative way. Our AI uh, uh, use case is a little bit different. Right from the beginning we um, try to design the AI to mimic uh, an army of equity analysts, army of investors. Our, our AI engine is more of finding the insights and uh, making decision based on the insight and learning from it. So the way a good investor goes about making a decisions and uh, and learning from it. So what we do, we we, uh, uh, we collect uh, financial data for almost like 15,000 global companies, including 6,000 uh, U.S. domestic companies. Plus, we look at uh, uh, their management team, how they uh, how they execute, and also we crawl almost more than millions of news articles and social media posts every day. And combine these things together, what we built is uh, collect those insights and use the insights to make decisions. So it is a more, for, more observable system so where you can uh, look at it and uh, see that, okay, hey, how good an insight is, how good a decision is, is there some learning that coming out of the decision? And, and, and imagine this, uh, our data is growing like alarming rate, like there is a Bloomberg article 90% of the data in existence, which is like few zettabytes, just created over the last two years. And I'm telling you, two years from now, we'll be saying exactly the same thing. The 90% of the data is created over the last two years. The data is growing so fast, there is no other way to really look at the data and make sense out of it. And AI is probably the only way to, to use it. I think uh, that's why we are here. Right, uh, when I uh, asked Manuel the same question, I mean, you're, you know, it'd be great to get your perspective on AI and how uh, you, know, you feel it pays off and why you would use it in your process versus a traditional approach. Well, I think that um, 
the best way to actually focus this question, uh, and the answer is by making a question to the audience. Uh, have you ever gone to a casino and played roulette? I suppose yes, right? Uh, I mean, um, if you play roulette, uh, you will see that basically it's a random process. And we can say that there uh, exist some similarities between um, uh, the stock market and uh, the roulette in, in the sense that the markets uh, also follow um, a random process. But if we go back around 30 years, there was a group of people in the MIT which created a little computer that was able to uh, actually measure the speed of the ball and the speed uh, 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 of the wheel to actually know where the ball was going to land. And the big difference between having a random process and a deterministic process in this uh, uh, kind of exam uh, example was basically the use of technology and uh, the amount of data that they could gather uh, through this computer. I really believe that uh, the financial markets are no different in the sense that the random processes that we see in the financial markets can actually be taken uh, as a random process plus a deterministic uh, uh, component, and the, the deterministic component depends on the amount of data that we can crunch. <coughs> now, if we see the mathematical studies uh, about the advantage that we can have by modeling a, a certain amount of data uh, via conventional methods, we will see that we will reach um, a, a plateau when the amount of data starts increasing exponentially. Now, the way to model this data in order to take a, a, an advantage uh, is by using a machine learning algorithm. Machine learning algorithms that can get complex as you start getting layers and layers and layers of data, layers and layers and layers in the model, what we call deep learning. So um, the way that we envision the use of artificial intelligence in uh, uh, the Biker ETF and in the uh, Rogers AI Global Macro Index is basically um, the extraction of vast amounts of data out of the uh, 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 out of the market to try to define uh, a better price objectives and values um, uh, of the financial markets around the world uh, to try to see in which ones we should position ourselves and in which one we should um, um, avoid a position. All right, uh, I want to turn this one over to Art. Uh, so your process uses IBM Watson for stock selection. Uh, you know, how is Watson employed, and, and why did you choose it over some other processes that you could build in-house? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question, probably, uh, especially initially when we launched, probably the most popular question is, uh, you know, why Watson? And the truth is, we actually have a very special relationship uh, with IBM. We're part of a couple of programs, the IBM Global Entrepreneur Program and the With, the with Watson Program. Uh, these are programs that, um, that the most promising AI companies, you know, get accepted into. And the truth is, uh, when we initially started off, um, Watson was the best platform for what it is that we were, we were doing at that time. Um, however, we've seen significant investments in different platforms, and there's a bunch of great platforms out there. And so we're not actually just using Watson. Uh, it's, it's our proprietary AI algorithms, but we're running it on Watson and other various uh, top platforms. And so a little bit about Cheetah is uh, Cheetah's background is in AI and machine learning. Uh, spent 18 years at, uh, at Intel working in that field. And we met while we were doing an MBA at Berkeley, but he also uh, did a master's at Stanford in the Indian Institute of Science uh, where he focused on machine learning. So before we chose a platform, we looked at all the various platforms out there and decided that Watson was the best. But as what we've seen is it is a very dynamically changing market. We're seeing all the money that's being invested in these various platforms um, because uh, we believe AI, and they must believe too, AI is, is going to be the future. And so uh, we're actually now less reliant on Watson um, than we were in the past, and we think things will kind of continue to change. And so uh, we're monitoring that situation, and we are committed to being on the best platform, whatever that is, whether that's, that's Watson or uh, Google DeepMind or Amazon or your previous employer, Intel. Uh, but yes, thanks, Jim. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, why, don't, why don't we uh, ask Mitch a question? So 
So my background is, is in quantitative uh, portfolio management, uh, a lot of smart beta, uh, index, and maybe you could explain to us why, you know, the ways in which AI differs from that, from sort of a traditional just quant model. Well, we started actually with smart beta. We actually designed a strategy initially, which is what we did Jim with initially. But uh, smart beta, there's a lot of smart beta out there now. It seems like everyone's focused on the smart beta. But everything that we design is to mitigate risk. So that's kind of our, our whole thesis, if you would, is to, to limit drawdowns and be unique. And the world doesn't need a different yeah, I, I think that I can give also a little bit more insight uh, on, on smart beta strategies and the composition of risk. Uh, because at the end of the, of the, of the day, uh, you have right now around 300 uh, kind of factors that are supposed to affect the market. And, and each year it grows exponentially. And you might question yourself, what is the validity of these factors? I mean, um, uh, are they subject to data snooping? Um, uh, uh, what, what it, why uh, all of these factors suddenly um, uh, grows uh, as the interest of in smart beta grows? Is there something to do there? Is there like a correlation between uh, uh, the marketing effort and the numbers of factors that are uh, applied in the market or that are found by the academic community? So uh, I have always asked myself these questions and have asked myself also the question, if enough people start seeing that there is an edge by applying a certain factor to invest, if enough people apply this factor, is the edge going to disappear? And that is why I think that a dynamic model where uh, the actual um, um, algorithm, uh, the actual model varies depending on the conditions of, of, of the market and on the data is the future. Because I really believe that static conditions and the composition of risk um, it changes over time. And we have seen this in multiple occasions. All right, thanks. Uh, so a, a, a question uh, for, uh, for Cheetah and Art. So, so AIEQ's platform processes over a million news articles and, and social media posts uh, on, on a daily basis, which is, I would consider, quite a bit of information to go through there. And, and there's a risk of kind of the garbage in, garbage, garbage out, you know, idea, right? That where, you know, maybe you've got bad data going in and you know how important data is in the quant space. We know that if, if you start with something that's bad, you're never going to get a good solution. So, so how do you, um, you know, pr protect the, you know, the, the strategy from garbage in, garbage out? You want to go first? Yes. So that's, that's actually a really important question. And um, as Chita said, there's this explosion of data, right? And AI is really the only tool really to kind of make, make sense out of it. And the, the issue isn't just that, um, you know, some data is important, other data uh, isn't important. It's actually uh, more of a spectrum, right? So you need to process in order to, to weave out um, even things that are, that are for, for example, uh, fake, like financial fake news, but you also need to understand the impact and the, the importance. So one of the things that she had mentioned that we're doing is we're looking at um, those, uh, we're processing the millions of news articles in the social media posts, and we're looking not just for things like sentiment, but understanding the events, the events that are occurring globally, and uh, both within the, uh, the 15,000 companies that we're, we're covering, and understanding how those events are impacting and how important those events are to those, those specific companies. And this is actually where, where several of our, our patents are around because this is a big problem uh, when it comes to AIs. You really need something to really make sense out of all that data and understand what's important and what's not important and how important it is. Anything you want to add, Chita? Yeah, so, so yeah, as I said, um, the fake news is one thing and, and the relevance is also another thing. So you have, you have to watch out for both of those items. Trump something tweets, is it <laughs> is it relevant or not? Sometimes it is. <laughs> we, even the insignificant things has significant value. Something sometimes the significant uh, major news probably have real less relevance. So the way uh, to look at it is that how it really has impacted the financial market, and and uh, we have our own uh, uh, IP around it to identify to find the credibility in the informations and uh, and and which ones really acted up, should be acted upon and to make learning out of it. I think over a period of time, our system gets smarter, recognizing more fake news, more irrelevant uh, items in the, in the news space. So, so the, the process actually has the ability to identify 
you know what is useful and what isn't. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's, right. That's very interesting. All right. So let's get in the weeds with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 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 Manuel, um, your your portfolio, your your approach. Um, currently has a significant allocation to, to treasuries, right? So, um, and uh, we notice this if we look up the index. We see it's about 28% in treasuries and then the rest in, in global equity. And so can you talk about what this might be saying about your model, I believe called Cassandra, is, uh, is saying about the global space and, and is equities, you know, a bad place to be right now? Well, um that is a very good question because um, obviously the equity markets internationally and uh, uh, considering that our fund is in US dollars uh, is subject to currency risk uh, among other kind of factors that may affect the equity markets globally, including uh, political risks and other kind of um, um, risks that we have to take into account. And, um, the main uh, thing why uh, the portfolio right now is at a 28% is, is because we are expecting a raising US dollar value, which will uh, basically devaluate uh, the positions that we would have uh, in equities uh, if we had uh, the position established there. So uh, we prefer to maintain, uh, aside from the equity markets right now, in a 28%, it might increase or it might decrease um, uh, in the coming months, but it's just uh, a pure risk management uh, approach to an increasing U.S. dollar value and uh, an overheating of the uh, international equity markets. One of the main um, uh, positions that we completely liquidated the past month because the artificial intelligence gave us clear signals that the market was going to collapse was Turkey. We had a big position in Turkey and we liquidated it on the 31st of uh, uh, July because artificial intelligence was telling us that the market was overheating and that there was going to be a financial crisis. It happened one week later and uh, now, just for your information, is telling us that we have a 25% premium and we should get enter again in order to try to capture it. So um, uh, that is basically um, uh, where we are uh, at 28 percent in bonds in order to mitigate the currency risk and in, uh, in order to mitigate the uh, overheating in the uh, international equity markets. Well, that's a great story. Uh, I, w I would give you a round of applause, but it, I know it's artificial intelligence, so <laughs> <laughs> it's not really him. <laughs> so he didn't do it. But um, but that that's that's a great story. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that if you know if we have any uh, doubts about you know the uh, you know, the efficacy of artificial intelligence and, you know, both of these guys, you know, both of these strategies have proven that it, uh, it does work uh, in, in, in many sort of scenarios. Uh, so then why don't I ask this of, uh, of Cheetah and Art. Uh, you know, one thing that I notice is there's a, at least in, the, in recent months, uh, a persistent bias uh, towards small cap. You know, what I would say is a, a bit of a size bet, uh, which has worked out very well. Uh, is this something that um, you feel is, is, is going to persist, or is it, um, you know, something that could turn around any minute now? I mean, is, what, what are the signals telling you uh, that, you know, uh, first of all, how, how did that happen? And second, of, you know, which is a great story, but again, is it more of a small cap bias in the fund? Or, uh, you know, is this something that we could see a change in at any moment? Okay. Let me, let me first try that. Um, so we, we look at uh, 6,000 um, public retail companies for uh, AIEQ. Uh, so when we look at all those companies, uh, we look at them with uh, many different lenses. Like we collect, like the way investor does, they look at the cap, the sector, uh, the value, all the different factors that you look at, it, you, we look at through the different kind of lenses. So we don't specifically say, okay, hey, group all of them into sectors, group all of them into cap, but try to find the value on, uh, on, on each of them and make a decision on it. So, so over a period of time, it, it, uh, it, it, it's, it's, everything is more of a data driven. Over a period of time, you can see the, 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 uh, our uh, sector classifications, our uh, cap, it, it changes over a period of time. And, and, and 
it, it tried to position itself so that to gain the so the, the, the objective of AIQ is to meet the volatility of broader US market. So that means our risk level is same as S&P 500, but deliver the performance. And it uh, plays different kind of scenarios. What is the best way it can meet those objectives? And uh, uh, so, so that kind of drives the decision of, okay, whether we want to be, what kind of companies. And some of the time it, it relies on uh, small caps to, to use that kind of meet their objectives. Right. Excellent. Uh, I said, by the way, I think right now we are close to 14% uh, small cap. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's not outrageous, but uh, I think in, you know, when we look at what's sort of causing, you know, what's driving performance or what's driving our performance, it's been that particular exposure. And, and again, I think that the timing is excellent. But um, so, so here's a, a question for, uh, for Mitch. Uh, you know, one obvious feature of, of the biker strategy is that it carries Jim Rogers' name. Uh, you know, can you talk about Mr. Rogers' involvement? This is for the benefit of those of us who were uh, in the audience this morning for, for Jim's speech, which I thought was really, really interesting, insightful. And uh, if you heard some of the things that, that Manuel has you know, just talked about, I think it echoes some of those things. So it's kind of a, a layup question, but <laughs> well, um, so can you talk about Jim's involvement? Uh, that's a question that, that I've heard. Yeah, so we, as I was alluding to uh, earlier, we actually developed a we actually developed a smart beta strategy that we went through initially. That we were gonna, it was it was actually phenomenal, setting all sorts of records. And um, when we met with him, he liked it and actually challenged us to create. He's like, because we had an idea of it was that was based on the U.S. And we were going to do an Asian fund, a Latin American one, so and so. And he said, it'd be much easier if you could take the same, well, he asked us, would the, would the algorithms work for more of a global macro uh, strategy? It, what we had previously developed would not. So basically challenged us to go create it. We went back to work a couple months later. I don't, I don't know how many months later it was, but went back with him. And it actually ended up working better than our original strategy. Hmm. We noticed all these patterns and different things, showed it to him. He understood it. He's like, well, this makes sense because I'm, Long Japan, Long Russia, whatever, whatever it is. So he, he really liked it, and he's ultimately challenging us. This, I mean, it's if anything, I would say Jim is, as he always talks in every interview about how he's terrible at market timing. <laughs> so his real involvement is to get involved with AI to uh, help help uh, help in those decisions of, of when and when to, when to enter and when to exit. So. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I want to add. Uh, to this a very special feature that we implemented in the artificial intelligence. Um, so our artificial intelligence is composed by three modules. Uh, but the last module is very special uh, because it's what we call an augmented intelligence uh, a module where we can basically input our ideas to try to make the AI work better models uh, in case that we are seeing that the AI is not crunching some data that we may think that will benefit the model. <laughs> And um, every conversation that we have with, with Jim, uh, in order to ask him for opinions on the, on the markets, I instantly go and test those ideas with the AI. Sometimes uh, the ideas uh, are very correlated. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, the ideas are, are, are not, but just because of a matter of time. Um, as, as, as Mitch said, uh, a problem of timing, right? Uh, so yeah, that is the involvement. All right. Well, um, Cheetah and, and Art, maybe you can share with us an example of how artificial intelligence led to, uh, you know, an investment decision. You know, maybe a, a trade that worked out really well, where it may not have even occurred uh, in a traditional approach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, sometimes uh, the kind of signals and the insights that we get is uh, even surprise us. Okay, uh, yeah, this that makes sense. Uh, for example, uh, um, just to give a contrast, right? So uh, uh, we we try to meet the uh, the risk of S and P 500 and uh, deliver the performance. That, that that's the that's the objective of the AI EQ. Um, so uh, I don't know if you remember uh, just few months ago in February when uh, uh, North Korea is saying, okay, hey, they are, uh, the whole West Coast corridor they can target missiles and. Uh, and, and trade wars are triggering up, that we saw a significant amount of volatility in the market. Uh, and you can see that a lot of sell activity started. Uh, and our system uh, went around and started doing diversification very effectively. 
we started uh, looking at the really good value positions like Walmart, super value, uh, to, to uh, diversify and minimize the risk. And those, those bets has been so well uh, paying out and holding those positions and uh, so so that uh, so it does it does, so the thing about it is the market is temporal that means you see things time variable wise like the thing you see things uniquely every time and the key critical thing is to learn from every decision that you make and you keep on adjusting it like we we, we take positions like uh, uh, the companies that we normally won't go like Gendesk, Jenga. Gendesk is a SaaS company and uh, we we saw in 22 days giving return of 13 percent just 22 days that's amazing zinga like right now that i think we saw the the news like they are trying to do with the disney uh, they'll be doing gaming for the disney so so those kind of uh, uh, activity looking at the market trend and see those events that is happening and taking the position of those kind of companies and returning um, giving the return is is, is really phenomenal and uh, i think that's why i think uh, uh, the fund is kind of, uh, not kind of, fund is doing really well compared to S&P because that, that's the object that we set to look at the, look at everything in the market and find the best possible opportunity so that you can minimize the risk and deliver the return. Excellent. So I wanted to uh, maybe take a few minutes and, and ask both groups uh, what you see as the future uh, or the, the next generation of artificial intelligence. Are, are there things that you know, you're you're looking at doing that maybe we can't necessarily do at this point, or you know, where do, where do you see this this going, the next generation? Why don't uh, Manuel? Why don't you start? Yeah, well, um, I've always seen artificial intelligence as a great tool to analyze data, but just that, a tool. So basically, I don't see artificial intelligence replacing uh, humans in the natural course of, of our lives, of our jobs. I think that the course of augmented intelligence, of complementing our minds or thinking with the machine, is what is going to give us a better knowledge and a better understanding of the world that surrounds us. And um, that is the way that we implement it. And uh, I think that that is the future. I think that the community has a very big problem. And uh, I, 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 I might... Mm, Tell you more about this afterwards in the <laughs> questions if you want. Passionate about it. Yeah, because I get very passionate and I can be speaking here for half an hour about it. But um, yeah, that, that is the way uh, that I think that is going to evolve. All right. How would you like to answer? Um, I, I'll take a little bit different view. Uh, it is definitely right now a tool, no doubt about that. Uh, but at the same time, um, um, 15 years ago, more than that, uh, I, I won't tell my age, uh, when doing masters, we were doing thesis on AI, writing the simple models of convolutional neural network model uh, on, on MATLAB with a Spark system. Like Those were the capabilities. And now think about the capability that we have right now, both in terms of hardware, software, algorithms. It's really grown exponentially. And we are right now. Uh, using it in many different ways. I don't know if you heard, like, right now the AI can even, uh, uh, in more creative ways, it can compose music. Uh, it can paint modern art. So, so I think that the, uh, uh, there is a trend right now going where it can take more and more job. It is definitely augmenting our capability, it is improving our productivity, but it is definitely getting more, uh, we, are, we are using it in more creative ways. I think if you see the, the, uh, how the Uber or ride share industry really disrupted it, uh, the transportation, similarly, the more disruption is going to happen. And there was, I want to report, uh, I want to re uh, refer, uh, there was a research report by the Mann Group. They said that by 2040, 99% of the asset is going to be directly or indirectly managed by the AI. So you will see that the, the AI will be used in like many different ways, be it investing, be it like trading is already been using, even structuring the deals, finding the, uh, creating new kind of deals, to and effectively executing the deals also, we, we can design that. But I think uh, it, it is the absolute it's a tool, but there is much more creative applications that we can use uh, for those tools in future. Excellent. And I think it also depends on the industry. I mean, medical, manufacturing, there's a multitude of things that'll actually 
get to first, but there's limitations in the deep learning and a lot of other applications. It'll eventually get there, but I agree with Manuel. It's not going to replace everything, but it wow. uses a tool. So That's good news. It doesn't replace <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Thank, thankful for that. Um, so, so I think before we, um, you know, turn it over the to to the audience for questions, I just wanted to give each group an opportunity uh, to to tell us why uh, people should consider their strategy. Uh, and uh, you know, Manuel, maybe you could start and and feel free to address your friends in Spain any way you like. <laughs> <laughs> you start well, in English. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, well. Uh, um, when you should use our strategy? I mean, wh why, why shouldn't you, you know? <laughs> the, the, main, the main thing here is that we are evolving to a world where factors are going to be uh, uh, diluted, uh, the returns of uh, smart bet are going to be diluted, and we are going to start relying more and more and more in artificial intelligence. We are one of the first funds out there that uses artificial intelligence. And we are using it in a very unique way. That is the way of augmented intelligence. Um, the results are going to speak by themselves. This month, the market, the, one of the main benchmarks, went down um, uh, an 8.5%. We went down only a 2%. Um, now we have to demonstrate that we are also capable of not only limiting risk, but also having that upside that uh, bonds don't procure. So only time will speak. But I really believe that our strategy and that the AI that we are using is unique and it will provide a substantial edge over other strategies out there. Yeah, sure. So I, I want to reiterate one of those points, which is uh, the, the factor investing. You've got to consider the alternative. So you can do factor investing, um, and factors over time, uh, they break down. Right? So AI is a much more flexible, dynamic way that's uh, data-driven, uh, free of human emotion, um, which we believe is, is, is a better way. Uh, but there's also other alternatives too, right? like indexing, for example. Uh, indexing, you get the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, <clears throat> what most people don't know with indexing, and I came from Vanguard, so I don't want to say anything you know, bad about indexing, but um, most people don't know that 65% of the constituents actually underperform the index and 40% of the constituents actually have long-term negative returns. Uh, so by using artificial intelligence and, and finding the, the right pieces of information, we believe you can really remove a lot of the, the bad and ugly and keep more of the good. And then you also have traditional active management, right? We're talking about all of the data. Um, it's just not possible for humans to uh, go through all of this information to get it all distilled into one brain to make a uh, to make a decision and connect all the dots, right? And so I, I think you really need to ask yourself, you know, is there going to be more data in the future or less, right? And then the last thing that I will kind of uh, leave with is that, uh, you know, whether, whether uh, we convinced you that artificial intelligence is the, uh, the wave of, uh, of the future, rather the future of asset management, or whether it's a bunch of magic, uh, the results kind of speak for themselves. So you can go to equibotetf.com uh, and you can see um, since inception that we've added uh, hundreds of basis points of, of returns um, with the similar risk of the S&P 500. Right? And this year, it's like one and a half times the, the return. So, um, you know, the results have been favorable and we're very, uh, you know, we believe that AI is, is going to be the future of investing. Gita, do you have anything to add? Or uh, no, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> <That's good. laughs> really Excellent answer. Good performance. All right, so we, uh, we've got about 10 minutes. If uh, anyone has a question, sure. I don't think we have a microphone here, so maybe we'll have to. I'll speak really well. Yes, go ahead. Um, you first. You don't really explain how you use AI. Like, what is the Maybe a further explanation on AI if uh, somebody wants to. Yeah. Take it. 
Yeah, we can repeat the question. So I think uh, it's a great question. The question is like how we use AI. Is it used for uh, trading, um, uh, for primarily for trading or uh, creating the portfolio, uh, like finding the companies for investments, how we use it? Um, so so we, we, uh, the AI EQ is an active ETF. So active in the sense it can uh, rebalance more, more frequently. And actually it can actually potentially rebalance every day. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, so uh, our strength is not uh, how fast we can trade. It's not a it's not a high speed trading uh, um, uh, tool. Uh, there are other high speed trading tools are out there. So it rebalances once every day. Like it can like at the end of the close of the day. Uh, what what it does is essentially try to find the best opportunities in the market. Find the companies that has the uh, the security power prices that there is a higher upside and uh, so take position in those companies. So what it does is that uh, we use AI like use natural language processing to read through all the news articles. We use different kind of learning mechanism like reinforcement learning to go through the financial data of uh, every companies out there, finding the creating the models out of the companies. So we use AI to uh, look at the management team, how they're executing their performance in the team and how can they meet the objective. So that's essentially combining these things together to find out the value in those companies and use those informations to construct a portfolio. So that, that's essentially the use of AI. And uh, I guess um, uh, Biker is differently, right? Yeah. 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 Biker is different in the sense that I'm, I'm going to answer okay, that. But, but Biker is different in the sense that it's a, a more passive approach. And what we are trying to do, I mean, what, what the artificial intelligence have told us is that uh, we basically cannot predict uh, uh, the markets uh, uh, at any moment in time. It's impossible. So what we are trying to see is calculate the cost of opportunity of actually maintaining a long position uh, versus liquidating because of the um, the data that we are gathering and analyzing uh, may tell us that uh, there is a very high chance or probability of the market uh, uh, actually uh, having a drawdown. And then is when we start deleveraging that position. That is just that. You know, that is how we and, use and, it. And I would say, I think the thought, and we'll get to you in just two seconds, but you know, behind artificial intelligence is being able to kind of learn from the existing conditions. So you, you, you know, you're trading today, and you learn something from that transaction and you, you are better at the next transaction. And you know, one thing I notice about these strategies is that they don't do a lot of sort of wasteful transacting where you, know, you can uh, you know, eat up performance and transaction costs. And um, you know, the, so the name of the game is really about you know, risk adjusted return and transaction costs adjusted return. You can come up with a back test that tells you that you, know, you outperform the S&P by you know, 3,000%. But you just can't implement it, you know. So it's so I think the you know what when we um, implement strategies like this with AI, it becomes smart enough to know when when it's it's not prudent to trade. So that's part of the decision, right? Is is you know when you don't do it. So um, yes. Uh, which American companies for the top two or three are working on AI? Oh. Wow, that's a good question. So um, I, I can definitely. Might, <laughs> might be really good. Yeah, there are. Um, the yeah, okay. The question. Sorry for that. Yeah, the question is uh, which top two American companies are working on AI? Actually, limiting to two is a is a, <laughs> is a difficult task. I can I can name few of the companies uh, who are really pioneering on the technology. Uh, definitely, IBM had a head start uh, when uh, when they started the IBM. Uh, um, Deep Blue um, beating uh, Gary, Gary Kasper, or somebody with the, the chess, right? <laughs> uh, so so uh, definitely IBM, Google, uh, even uh, Amazon ML. Um, Amazon has really extensive machine li learning libraries out there. So those are the big companies that really, uh, I, I mentioned this company, they, they, they not only they're developing AI, they're making uh, companies like us use that technology. Uh, there are many, actually there are many companies um, right now using, uh, developing AI or using AI. Like there are, if you go in the Silicon Valley, there are 
uh, filled with uh, companies who does develop like in, uh, deep learning models. You just you know, like there's a company called OneClick. You can go there and create a model uh, uh, using uh, whatever the object you want to set. Uh, so yeah, so uh, but if you if you look at the the top companies who are really working on it and the in the, in the algorithm space is uh, I will say Google, IBM, Amazon, and in the hardware space, uh, AI requires uh, the lot of uh, floating point operations like the graphics kind of operations. Uh, Nvidia is doing a great job uh, providing the hardware. Uh, even even the companies that Google also they are also building their own TensorFlow processors which can be extensively used for the deep learning also. All right, very good. Yes, sir. You had your yes. No, I, I understand what you're saying about the future of AI. Uh, being able to take big data and make better decisions out of it. But it seems like today, and I wanted to comment, you know, there are supercomputers now trading in microseconds on, on the stock market. But it seems like it's legal. I haven't heard about any, anyone getting in trouble for that. But that's AI, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it is, absolutely. I mean, there are algorithms out there, high-frequency trading algorithms that adapt to the actual conditions of the, the microstructure of the market, taking account uh, deepness of the market, uh, 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 volumes, uh, the price sensibilities, uh, everything. I, myself, have created some of those. But um, um, the main problem with those algorithms is that you don't have a human component in them. So what happens if the algorithm suddenly uh, start taking data in the correct way, in, in the incorrect way? Something like uh, what happened to Knight Capital a few years ago may happen, right? So we need to be a little bit careful about how we apply AI. AI right now is in, uh, I don't know how to say this in English, you know, in, in diapers, OK? <laughs> AI right now is in the beginning of, of its um, uh, history. Back then, it was symbolic AI. In the 50s, with the invention of back propagation, then everything started evolving a little bit more. We have passed two AI winters. We might get into the next one, you know? And we, um, we must acknowledge that the technology is far for, from being perfected, you know? It's still a lot of work there. Yes. Well, I think you're actually touching on what I'm concerned about. I was started in computer science in the late 1960s. So I've seen at least four heydays of AI where it was about to take over the world. And a lot of people out of work. And after a few years, it kind of didn't meet its expectations. Pretty soon there was no money to invest in AI. It went silent for a few years, then it comes back up. When the next generation graduate right, students gets gets to school and then back down. How do we know we're not doing the same thing again? I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of concerned that just as, this is number five, that, uh, that wave, and then there's another one. It's like the ocean, you know? You suddenly think that the, the level of the ocean is higher, but you're just sitting at the top of one wave. Well, that, that, is, that is a very, very good comment. And, um, you know, it's happening. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, the community is giving a lot of uh, importance to back propagation. And back propagation is only knowledge that the uh, machine acquires uh, by experience. But back propagation don't put that knowledge in context. Back propagation don't put um, a, a previous knowledge into the model. Um, and we are coming to a moment where the only way that I see AI evolving uh, a, a into something new is with the implementation of quantum computing uh, when it appears. Um, because we have a lot of structural problems within the, the own algorithms, problems with activation functions, for example, problems such as uh, the vanishing gradient or the dying relu problem that um, uh, really limits the capacity of AI right now. And um, we have to work on, on, on those problems. Real quick, Cheetah, we only have about a minute, so I wanted to give you a chance. Yeah, so um, um, to, to, uh, for, a, for a new idea to succeed, you need different things, like the whole ecosystems to be there. So like you need to uh, have a, a real problem. 
you need to have a hardware or the baseline to support it you need to have software you need to have the uh, intellectual uh, people involved in making it happen i think uh, we we were in an imbalance before on um, specifically the ai space we, we i think we had algorithms uh, but the hardware was not ready uh, like we are trying to simulate in the in the i86 processor uh, or, 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 or in a, uh, uh, like the other the old hardwares it was not enough good enough right now with the, with the advent of our uh, the effective use of gpus and the new kind of architectures coming up on, on board like tensor architecture so it is effectively using the whole ecosystem and and the problem is growing as, as we talked about the data the problem is really definitely growing really in alarming rate and uh, the, the the ecosystem and the problems are kind of marrying together to make it happen so i think uh, is it is it going to be the fifth wave die down and sixth wave going to come? Uh, I think we are already there right now, and, and it is all those uh, the things that is coming in the pipeline. Uh, quantum computing is good, but before quantum, there are so many new technologies are there, uh, we, which will be uh, uh, making it much more useful. So I think uh, we are there right now to use the cap cap the the full capac capability of. Uh, the technology well, right I now. Right, <laughs> I, I think there is. The IBM Stretch was the biggest computer ever. Then there was the CDC 6600. Then it was the Cray 1 and then the Cray 8. And you all needed that because that was the infrastructure you needed to make that happen. Right. And you, all those things are slowly. Well, that's ju ju just to close uh, on, 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 on your point, I think that AI will continue evolving as soon as academics start uh, approaching AI in a symbolic and non-symbolic way combined, rather than in a non-symbolic way. Um, uh, so basically, stop using back propagation only, right? Uh, combine also the knowledge that we have had and that we have created over all of these years. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. We're out of time, but really appreciate uh, you coming to our session.